Hello, my fellow minor league nerds, and welcome to our newest episode of the Mostly Forgotten Team series. This episode is about the Milwaukee Brewers. Wait a minute. How can the Milwaukee Brewers be featured on the Mostly Forgotten Team series? Everyone knows the Milwaukee Brewers. Oh, we're not talking about the current Brewers who play at Mil er, Milwaukee's American Family Field in the National League Central. We're going much further back, all the way back to 1902 to be exact. Before the Seattle Pilots went bankrupt seven days before the start of the 1970 season, and moved to Milwaukee to become the modern-day Brewers, there was another Brewers team that played in the American Association from 1902 through 1952. Those are the Brewers that this episode is about. The Brewers' name had been used before 1902. It had been around since the 1880s, but those early clubs didn't have much stability or success. The longest-lasting pre-1900 team were the Brewers who played in the Western League from 1894 to 1899, but they also didn't have much success, usually finishing in 6th or 8th place, except for two seasons when they finished in 3rd. Connie Mack, who had managed the Philadelphia Athletics for 50 years, managed them from 1897 to 1900. In 1900, the Western League was renamed the American League, declaring itself a major league in 1901. The Brewers would play those two seasons. In 1901, they would finish in last place, with a 48-89 and record, 35 and a half games behind the pennant-winning Chicago White Sox, while playing at Lloyd Street Grounds. When the American League declared itself to be a major league, league president Ban Johnson wanted the team to move from Milwaukee the 15th largest city in the country at the time, to St. Louis, which was the fourth largest city, as he knew they wouldn't make it in the beer capital of the world. Team owners Matthew and Henry Killalia persuaded him to give Milwaukee a chance. If they did not do well the first season, then they would move the team to St. Louis. And that's exactly what happened, leaving Milwaukee without a professional team. In 1901, Thomas J. Hickey, who had recently been appointed president of the Western League and was a founder of the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues, today known as Minor League Baseball, wrote to the postmasters of eight Midwestern cities requesting their opinion on the prospect of professional baseball in each city. The favorable replies led him to call a meeting on November 29, 1901, at the Leland Hotel in Chicago, where a new professional league, the American Association, was founded. Hickey would resign from his position at the Western League in order to lead his new creation. The league was scheduled to begin in 1902. It decided to play as an independent, outside of organized ball, because it considered itself out of the minor class, although admittedly not on par in playing strength with the National or American Leagues. It would join the National Association starting in 1903, being designated as Class A, the highest classification at the time. One of the eight teams added to the new league was placed in Milwaukee, taking the Brewers' name. In their first season of 1902, the Brewers finished in sixth place, with a 65-75 and record. They wouldn't win any league pennants in their first decade, finishing in second place three times in 1905, 1906, and 1909, with that last year being their closest finish to first. Player highlights during that first decade include Claude Elliott throwing 226 strikeouts in 1903, George Stone hitting 405 with 626 at-bats in 1904, and Stoney McGlynn pitching 446 innings with 27 wins and 14 shutouts in 1909 all of which were long-standing league records. In their first two seasons of existence, there was actually a second minor league team in Milwaukee, the Creams, who played in the Western League. The Creams would win the 1903 Western League Championship, but would fold the following season. The American Association and the Western League each had teams in Milwaukee and Kansas City and would negotiate territorial rights as both had the Class A designation. As a result, the Creams and the Blue Stockings would fold, 
leaving both cities to the American Association teams. The team's second decade was a roller coaster ride, which began with their primary owner, Charles Havener, passing away on April 3, 1912, just nine days into the season. Ownership passed to his widow, Agnes, who became a pioneer as one of the earliest women to run a high level professional baseball club. One of her first moves was to hire future Hall of Famer Hugh Duffy as a manager. But his skills couldn't produce the desired results, as the Brew crew landed in fifth place for the second straight year, with 78 and 85 record, 26 games out of first. Success, though, was finally right around the corner. Agnes Havener adjusted her strategy and hired longtime Brewers third baseman Harry Pep Clark as the team's new manager, starting in 1913. He would act as a player manager and was a multifaceted contributor, leading the team to its first American Association pennant in 1913, when they finished 167, three games ahead of the Minneapolis Millers. Clark finished with a 286 batting average, which was good enough for second on the team behind Newt Randall. Pitcher Cy Slapnicka led the league with 25 wins against 14 losses, appearing in 47 games while pitching in 321 innings. On October 10, 1913, Agnes would step down as the team president, but remain the principal owner, saying to the Milwaukee Journal, My one ambition was to give Milwaukee a pennant-winning ball team. Having succeeded at this, and also having demonstrated a woman's ability to attain her ambition, I am willing to step out of active management of the business. The Brewers would repeat in 1914, with Harry Clark once again leading the team. They would finish 98-68, and four games ahead of the Louisville Colonels. That season, pitcher Joe Havlick was the crown jewel of the Brewers' pitching staff, winning 24 games with 14 losses in 47 starts. He struck out 217 batters with 134 walks in 323 innings pitched. Newt Randall would lead the team again with a 321 batting average and 21 stolen bases. Unfortunately, the team would have to wait another 21 years before winning another pennant. In 1916, Jim Thorpe would play for the Brewers in what would be their worst season ever when they went 54 and 110. True to form, though, Thorpe had an excellent season in the Brew City, stealing 48 bases and batting 274, which was good enough for second on the team behind Johnny Beal. The Brewers would not escape the second division until 1924, when they finished fourth place with an 83-83 and record. One of the highlights during this down period was in 1920, when Milwaukee native Joe Hauser had a fantastic season. He played 156 games, hitting 284, and belting out a team-leading 15 home runs, 22 doubles, 16 triples, and driving in 79 runs. He returned in 1921, driving in 110 runs while hitting 20 homers, elevating his batting average to 316. In 1922, he would move on to the Philadelphia Athletics. Hauser would later hit 63 home runs for the Baltimore Orioles in the International League in 1930 and 69 for the Minneapolis Millers in 1933. He remained the only player to hit 60 or more homers twice until Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa accomplished this feat in 1998 and 1999. In 1926, Jack Lillevelt would be hired as manager. He had a moderately successful career playing in both the major and minor leagues. He actually set the International League record for the longest hitting streak at 42 games in 1912 when playing for the Rochester Hustlers. It would stand until 2007, when it was broken by Brandon Watson. In his first season as a manager, he led the team to its first serious run at the pennant since 1914, when they finished in third with a 93-71 and record. In 27, they finished tied for second place with the Kansas City Blues, with a 99-69 and record, two games behind the Toledo Mudhens, who were led by Casey Stengel. 
1928 would see another third place finish with a 90 and 78 record. In 1929, Lelevelt would leave after 59 games with a record of 21 and 37. The Brewers finished in seventh place that season, going 69 and 98. Team owner Otto Borchert, who purchased the team in January 1920, died suddenly at the age of 52 on April 27, 1927, while giving a speech before the Elks Club in Milwaukee. In 1929, Henry Killalia, who had owned the Western and American League Brewers before the latter moved to St. Louis, passed away. Both of their deaths cast a dark cloud over the team. Things didn't improve with the Depression beginning later in the year, which of course affected the team's attendance, seeing it drop to its lowest in over a decade. 1936 would be the team's best season since 1928, with them looking like winners all season. It would also be their first year as an affiliated club, as they signed up with the Detroit Tigers for that one season. Described as one of the most potent and balanced team in minor league history, the Brewers' team batting average wasn't quite impressive at 295, the league average, but their top three pitchers each won 19 games. The combined record of Forrest Tot Presnell, Joe Heving, and Luke Hot Potato Hamlin was 57 wins against 35 losses, while each sported an ERA well under four. Ted Gullick was on his way to a career season before injury caught him and chilled his sizzling bat, but he still ended up hitting 329. Longtime catcher and first baseman for the Detroit Tigers, Rudy York, joined the team for the season, hitting 334 in 619 at bats. Milwaukee native Chet Labs did his hometown fans proud with his all around talent finishing the season with 42 home runs to lead the league. He hit 325 and led the team with 151 RBIs. The Brewers finished with a 90-64 and record, five games up on the St. Saint Paul Saints. For the first time in their history, the Brewers played in playoff games. They would sweep the Kansas City Blues in the first round before defeating the Indianapolis Indians four games to one to win their third American Association title. They would then go on to defeat the Buffalo Bisons of the International League in the Junior World Series, four games to one. The next five seasons weren't all that great, as the Brewers slipped in the standings, unable to climb any higher than third place, and seeing two last-place finishes in 1940 and 1941. They were affiliated with the Cleveland Indians for two seasons in 1937 and 1938, switching to the Chicago Cubs for the 1939 season, before returning to an independent in 1940. In the 1940s, the team introduced a mascot known as Ovgust. He had a beer barrel for a torso and a tap for his nose, embodying the whimsical spirit of the minor leagues in the early to mid-20th century. In the 40s and 50s, a series of beer barrel men were used as logos by the club, seeing him in various baseball poses. They even went as far as depicting him in a Santa Claus suit with a long white beard. He was discontinued when the team left town. When Bud Selig brought baseball back to Milwaukee in 1970, Ovgust, simply known as Beer Barrel Man, returned to the organization, adopting a swinging pose in a team logo. He was used by the club through the 1977 season. On January 25, 2015, he was brought back once again, now known simply as Barrel Man. The last decade of the Brewers' existence would be their most successful, as they would make the postseason in 9 of 11 seasons. In 1941, the struggling club was purchased by the young and dynamic Bill Veck, son of former Chicago Cubs president William Veck Sr., bringing with him former Chicago Cubs star Charlie Grimm, who would serve as manager. They would become affiliated with the Cubs once again between 1941 and 1944. Under Veck's ownership, the Brewers would become one of the most colorful organizations in baseball. Always a showman, 
Vec quickly employed numerous colorful and controversial tactics for generating public interest in the team, such as giving away live animals, offering morning games in order to accommodate third shift workers at the city's factories, staging weddings at home plate, and even sending Grimm a birthday cake containing a much-needed left-handed pitcher. He would often mingle with the crowd as a way of promoting the team. In November of 1943, he enlisted with the Marine Corps. Twelve games into the 1944 season, Charlie Grimm left Milwaukee after accepting an offer to return to Chicago to manage the Cubs once again, leaving the Brewers to a 10-2 record. Grimm felt obligated to find a competent replacement, and recommended that veteran manager Casey Stengel, who had last managed the Boston Braves in 1943, be brought in to replace him. Vec opposed the idea, thinking poorly of Stengel's managerial skills. But since he was stationed in Guadalcanal, there was nothing he could do to stop it. Stengel proved to be the correct choice, as the team kept winning, leading to Vec withdrawing his objections by the end of May. Stengel led the team to a second straight pennant with a 102 and 51 record. Unfortunately for the city of Milwaukee, they would fall in the first round to eventual league champions, the Louisville Colonels, four games to two. Stengel would not return in 1945, even after Vec offered to rehire him. Instead, he accepted an offer made by George Weiss to begin his career with the New York Yankees, managing their top farm club, the Kansas City Blues. Nick Old Tomato Face Cullop was brought to take over, holding the position for five seasons. He was liked by his players and fans alike. After three consecutive pennants, Vex sold his interest in the Brewers after the 1945 season for a $275,000 profit. The new owners would affiliate with the Chicago White Sox for the 1946 season, slipping into fifth place with a 70-78 and record. Before the start of the 1947 season, the Milwaukee Brewers would be purchased by Lou Perini, owner of the Boston Braves. They would become the top farm club for the team. In their first full season under his ownership, they'd finish in third place with a 79-75 and record. Good enough to qualify for the postseason. They defeated the Kansas City Blues in six games in the first round, before defeating the Louisville Colonels in seven to win their fourth American Association championship. Then they went on to defeat the Syracuse Chiefs of the International League in seven to win their second Junior World Series title. A familiar face would return in 1951, when Charlie Grimm came back to Milwaukee to lead the Brewers once again enjoying huge success by once again winning the American Association title, as well as their third Junior World Series championship. He would lead them to first place over the first two months of the 1952 campaign, before being promoted to manager of the Boston Braves on May 31st. Even after losing Grimm, the Brewers continued their winning ways, winning the pennant with a 101-53 record, 12 games up on the Kansas City Blues. They would sweep the St. Paul Saints in four in the first round of the playoffs. Things wouldn't go so great in the championship against the Blues, as the Brewers would fall in seven games. Since the team began, they had played at Borchard Field, which opened as Athletic Park in 1888. The city of Milwaukee had long been coveted by major league teams looking for a new home, and the city of Milwaukee was looking to join the major league ranks. City officials knew that Borchardt Field was too small to accommodate a major league team. That led them to construct Milwaukee County Stadium, which was opened in 1953 with a seating capacity of over 36,000. It was designed to put many major league parks to shame and openly intended to lure one of them to the Cream City. Bill Vec, who purchased the St. Louis Browns in 1951, tried to relocate the team to Milwaukee in 1952, only to be blocked by the other American League owners. There was also a chance that the other St. Louis team could have moved to Milwaukee as well. The Cardinals were in a bad situation when their owner, Fred Sy, pleaded no contest to two counts of income tax evasion 
stemming from his purchase of the club six years earlier. The National League moved quickly to expel him from organized ball and to get him to sell the team before starting his 15-month prison term. On January 30, 1953, local brewer and sports booster Frederick C. Miller told the Milwaukee Journal that he had been offered a chance to bring the Browns to Milwaukee over the previous winter. But the move would not have included a majority ownership stake, which wasn't to his liking. At the same time, he denied that he had been in talks to buy the Cardinals, which wasn't true, as Sy had already offered to sell him the club. Miller balked at Sy's asking price of $4.5 million, but they continued to negotiate. Other parties were interested in the Cardinals, including groups from St. Louis and Houston, but Milwaukee seemed the favorite to win. At one point, office staff were told that the organization would cover their moving expenses if they decide to move to Milwaukee with the team. In the end, Anheuser-Busch bought the team for $3.75 million to keep them in St. Louis, leaving the Brewers to move into County Stadium for opening day on April 15th. Meanwhile, in Boston, the National League Braves had been struggling since their 1948 pennant. Fans just were not turning up to Braves Field. Team owner Lou Perini had done all he could do to stop the tide. He fixed up the ballpark, adding fried clams and televisions at the concession stands, neon foul poles, and a $75,000 electric scoreboard. He spent money on player development, promoting great young talent. He even integrated his team nearly a decade before the Red Sox, acquiring speedy outfielder Sam Jethro in a deal with the Brooklyn Dodgers a move that may have actually done more harm than good in a then-racially-divided city. But nothing he did brought in fans. Going into spring training 1953, Perini had every intention of opening the season as the Boston Braves. But with fans not responding to his moves to improve the lineup and Braves field, and with less than 500 season tickets being sold for the 1953 season, things were still not looking good. Milwaukee, on the other hand, was growing and had a strong factory-based economy that was boosted by World War II contracts, as well as several prosperous breweries. Fans in the city packed brewers' games and longed for a major league team. As owner of the Milwaukee Brewers, Perini held the major league territorial rights to the city. With the new stadium ready to open, he decided it would be best to move his team to the beer capital of the world. On March 18, 1953, with the help of the National League president, Warren Biles, Perini received the required unanimous vote from his seven fellow National League owners to transfer his club to Milwaukee, where they would have incredible success, drawing 1.8 million fans in their first season. They won back-to-back pennants in 1957 and 1958, as well as the 1957 World Series. In 1959, They finished the season tied with the Los Angeles Dodgers, but would be swept in a three-game playoff series, two games to nothing. With the move of the Braves to Milwaukee, this left the Brewers without a home with less than a month before the start of the season. They would move to Toledo, Ohio, who had lost their longtime team, the Toledo Mudhens, the previous season, when they relocated to Charleston, West Virginia on June 23, 1953 becoming the Charleston Senators. In Toledo, they would stay affiliated with the Milwaukee Braves and adopt the name the Toledo Sox. They would have an incredible first season, drawing 343,672 fans, over 96,000 more than their next closest team, the Kansas City Blues. They would win the pennant with a 90-64 and record. In the first round of the playoffs, they beat the Louisville Colonels in seven, but would fall to the Blues four games to three in the championship series. They would miss the postseason their next two seasons, finishing in sixth place in 1954 and fifth in 1955. Their attendance would also drop considerably to just under 157,000 in 1954 and just under 188,000 in 1955. But both were still good enough for second and third place in their league. 
After three seasons in Toledo, the Milwaukee Braves moved the team to Wichita, Kansas, where they became the Wichita Braves, playing in Lawrence Dumont Stadium. The Wichita Indians of the Western League, who had played in the city since 1950, would fold when the Braves came to town. Toledo wouldn't see another team until 1965, when the Richmond Virginians came to town and were renamed the Toledo Mud Hens, the same team that exists today. The team was pretty successful in Wichita, even if the fan support wasn't always there. In their first season, they were led by George Selkirk, finishing in seventh place with a 65-88 and record. They drew fewer fans than their last season in Toledo, when only 109,207 came out. Earl Hirsch, who had a nine-year career, only seeing seven games in the majors with the Milwaukee Braves, was the team's top hitter with a 307 average and 27 home runs. Legendary minor league manager Ben Garrity was brought in to run the team in 1957. He led them to the league pennant with a 93-61 record. Carl Willey led the league with 21 victories, and Joey Jay was second with 199 strikeouts and 18 complete games. The offense was led by Ray Shearer, who only had two major league plate appearances in his 12-year career, when he hit 316 with 28 doubles and 29 home runs. Unfortunately for the team, they fell in the first round of the playoffs to the St. Paul Saints, four games to one. That year, their attendance climbed to 145,028, but still came in sixth in the eight-team league. Garrity was named American Association Manager of the Year. The following year, they slipped to second place, finishing 83-71, and 71, with their attendance dropping as well, when only 101,371 fans showed up. Carl Willey only had seven starts, as he was called up to the big league club. But he threw a no-hitter on May 22nd against Louisville before that happened. Ed Hirsch hit 17 home runs and drove in a league-high 98 runs. Pitcher Red Murph went 11-5 with a 1.8 ERA. Once again, the Braves fell in the first round of the playoffs, this time being knocked out by the Minneapolis Millers. Following that season, Milwaukee switched its affiliation to the Louisville Colonels, and the Wichita team was relocated to Fort Worth, Texas, becoming the Fort Worth Cats, and affiliated with the Chicago Cubs. The team only lasted one season, but it was an exciting one. The American Association expanded for the first time ever, becoming a 10-team circuit when the Houston Buffs and Dallas Rangers moved up from the AA Texas League. The Cats finished in second place in the West Division, with an 81-81 and record, qualifying for the postseason. They swept the Louisville Colonels in the first round, four games to nothing, but fell in seven to the Minneapolis Millers in the championship series. They did not draw well, with only 97,315 coming out to root for the team. It was the lowest in the American Association that year. Following that season, the American Association shrunk back down to eight teams as the Omaha Cardinals folded and the Fort Worth Cats merged with the Dallas Rangers, who outdrew them in 1959 by more than 30,000. The new team became the Dallas-Fort Worth Rangers. After several relocations and name changes, today they are the Albuquerque Isotopes. With that merger, the historic franchise that began in Milwaukee as a founding member of the American Association in 1902 came to an end. During the entire history of the franchise from 1902 to 1959, they threw eight no-hitters and were the victims of seven. Brewers pitching threw six, with the Toledo Sox and Wichita Braves each throwing one. The Brewers team was the victim of all seven no-hitters, with one being a six-inning perfect game thrown by Mickey Hafner of the Minneapolis Millers on May 26, 1927. During that same period, the team won 11 American Association pennants and five league championships. The Brewers would see nine of the pennants, with the Toledo Sox and Wichita Braves each winning one. All league championships would be won in Milwaukee. 
The Brewers won three Junior World Series championships in 1936, 1947, and 1951. Before that series became an annual event, they defeated the Denver Bears of the Western League in a postseason series in 1913, four games to two, as well as the Birmingham Barons of the Southern Association in 1914 by the same result. Well, my fellow minor league nerds, that'll do it for this episode. Thanks for nerding out with me. And as always, never stop supporting minor league baseball and never stop learning about minor league baseball history. This podcast is part of the Curved Brim Media Network. Here are some of the other members of Curved Brim Media. Hi, this is Ed Rivera of the Data Chronicles. Join me as I interview people just like you and players, coaches, GMs on the path that led you to become a fan of the sport. I'm Paul Caputo, and on the Baseball by Design podcast, I talk to minor league baseball teams, designers, and other super interesting people about what these minor league baseball logos mean. And I talk a little bit about ice cream helmets. What's up, Bucketheads? I'm Anna DiTomaso, and each week on the Baseball Bucket List podcast, I speak with a different fan about their favorite baseball memories, what the game means to them, and what's left to check off on their baseball bucket list. Hey everyone, it's Eric from the great state of Kansas. This is Johnny from the New Orleans Baby Cakes Memorial Museum. And we are the Earn Fun Average Podcast. Where we talk to a variety of guests about their love of baseball and have fun doing it. America, lower your standards. Average is what we do best. This is Patrick. And Corey. Of BaseballMapper.com. And we have made an interactive map to help highlight all baseball teams from the majors down to collegiate summer leagues. We want to bring you closer to baseball. So get on the site and find a team near you today. Hey guys, this is Patrick Larson from the Minor League Baseball Hat History Series. And in every episode, I go through the history of minor league teams through my personal collection of hats. You can find me on Twitter at at PatLarson1. I hope you guys enjoy. Learn more about Curve Brim Media at CurveBrimMedia.com.